we're very glad to have uh, Barry Lawrence speaking again this week. Um, it wasn't mentioned during the prayer time, but uh, continue to pray for uh, Betty Omayo, John and Betty Omayo. Um, John was scheduled to speak recently and uh, Barry has filled in for him, but uh, let's continue to pray for John and Betty. Um, the, uh, I don't think there's any other announcements. We'll just turn uh, the remainder of the meeting over to Barry. Well, good morning online. Good morning here. It's good to see you all. Uh, just to let you update on John and Betty, I talked with John and Betty this, talked to John this week. I try to keep up with them and, and meet with them at least every other week, continue to be praying for them. Uh, there's really no change and uh, it's a very difficult time and understandably so. And I know they would appreciate your continued prayers. And uh, as I mentioned, I think last week, because John was scheduled to preach yes, last Sunday and this Sunday, and uh, but he sort of uh, understandably is bailed out so i've been filling in for him and, and i said i'd be willing to do that and i'm actually on the 23rd was scheduled we started a series a mini series of questions the bible asked and last week he did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things it's a great passage romans 8 32 we spent some time on that uh, two weeks from now, Lord willing, and you'll see why I'm saying that when we get to the passage next, uh, two weeks from now, is what is our life? What is our life? From James chapter 4. And this morning, as I promised, uh, what was Lord willing? When the foundations are destroyed, what do the righteous do? Psalm 11. So if you have your Bible, turn to Psalm 11, or you can listen to the, the word as I read it. It's a short psalm, seven verses. And the question's embedded in sort of the middle of that psalm. But there's something David's saying to us here. The psalms is saying to us to help us understand what we are to do when the foundations are destroyed. So read along with me or just listen to the word. In the Lord I take refuge. How can I say to my soul, flee like a bird to the mountain? For the wicked bend their bow. They have fitted their arrow in the string to shoot in the dark, the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what are the righteous to do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur, and scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Let's go to prayer and commit this time for the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word, your inspired word, your inerrant word. We thank you for inspiring the psalmist to pen this psalm and to ask that question, the question that's very appropriate for us today in our nation, our culture, and what we're experiencing. So Holy Spirit, take your truth, help us to apply it to our situation, to see your greatness and to respond to the truth of Psalm 11. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In a recent book, uh, Dr. Al Mohler, who some of you may know is the president of Southern Seminary, is one of those guys that has an IQ probably of 300, if that's possible. In fact, I'm told, I've never been there, but his library, his personal library, would fill this room double. Uh, he's an amazing reader and uh, Maybe a speaker, but he wrote a book called The Gathering Storm. Oh, by the way, just just a sidebar. You know, we hear a lot of bad, a lot of news, a lot of news commentary. If you're not familiar with Al Mohler's The Briefing, subscribe to it. It's free. Monday through Friday, he he deals with 
current events and gives a biblical worldview is absolutely <clears throat> essential. If you have it, don't have an opportunity, and you can, it's on podcast, but also about 11 o'clock is transcripted as well. And, and so I usually read the transcripts a little faster for me to do that, but uh, that, that's, that's not in the sermon, it's a sidebar, but it's, it's really worth it. He does an excellent job really interpreting what's happening. It's called The Briefing, Al Mohler. You can get it online. Anyhow, in his recent book, The Gathering Storm, uh, the title of the book, he sort of stole from Winston Churchill, Churchill, not Churchville, Churchill. Uh, you may not be familiar with uh, history. Uh, I'm a sort of history buff. I a lot of, read a lot of history, but in the 1930s, uh, Winston Churchill <laughs> was the one of the lone voices warning about the gathering storm about Nazi Germany and Adolf Hitler as he was coming to power. And if you remember your history, remember it sort of poo pooed him and said, ah, it's not, not going to happen. He said, it's a gathering storm, a gathering storm. And it was prophetic because, as we know, late 1930s into the 40s, of course, Nazi Germany began to conquest, became the evil empire, World War II. Anyhow, Dr. Moeller, how does this book, The Gathering Storm, but it's not in the context, obviously, of World War II. But it's the gathering storm of increasing hostility and intolerance to the gospel, to biblical morals, where our culture has become antagonistic and even hostile to the church, to biblical foundations. And so he wrote a book called The Gathering Storm. I read it a few weeks ago. It's a great book. He covers some of the topics. But here's what he writes. He said, the secular age undermines the very conditions that make our civilization possible. The secular storm we face undercuts all notions of authority, placing on the throne the subjective self, a false notion of liberated humanity freed from the shackles of theism and biblical worldview. Because on the right, these days, right now, we find ourselves opposed, dismissed, or ridiculed for holding truths that the Christian church has taught for 2,000 years. It is a battle that rages between revolution or revelation. He's spot on. I mean, we don't, we don't have to detail all that's happened in our courts, what's happening in our culture right now. Uh, you're well versed on that. So what does this have to do with David? Well, apparently for David at this time, we don't know all the historical context, but his foundations, moral foundations, were being destroyed. The very foundation of his country was being destroyed. Many believe he was king at this time when he wrote this, but clearly there was a dark storm hovering over David and the righteous of that nation. And they were becoming the targets of the, for the unrighteous. It was a threat that David recognized. And the question is, would they be able to outrun this gathering storm? Now David's response to this pressure from the unrighteous where the righteous just had targets on their back, really gives us insight, I think, and helps us in our day as how we can respond to what we're experiencing and we'll experience even more. Yeah, I don't have to get into a lot of this, but we are living, Francis, other biblical philosophers have taken that another step. We're living in a post-truth culture a post-truth culture. So what did David do? How did he respond to this culture that was darker, this gathering storm around his nation that threatened the righteous? Well, the first, I'm gonna give you three principles. Number one, take refuge in the Lord. Take refuge in the Lord. You see it right at the beginning of verse one. David declares, 
in the Lord I take refuge. He acknowledged that his only source of protection, of security, was in the Lord himself. In the midst of this dark gathering storm of the unrighteous attacking the righteous. And isn't that certainly true for us today, right? Where do we take refuge? Where do we find our protection? Where do we find our security in the midst of this gathering dark storm that we're experiencing, that we've never experienced probably in, in the history of the church, certainly in the United States? He is our rock. He is our refuge. He's our security. Some of you might be familiar with the old gospel hymn. He's a shelter in the time of storm. He's the rock. And David's declaring that right at the outset, in the midst of this dark, <coughs> foreboding storm of, of hostility and intolerance of the righteous in his nation. He's a shelter in the time of storm. One translation put it this way. I trust in the Lord for my protection. But then look at the verse one, what happens? There seems to be someone, the commentators aren't exactly sure, but it could be an advisor or a friend, or maybe he's even reflecting on what, his, what he's saying to himself. But there's this temptation here to sort of panic and get out of Dodge because of what's happening. Notice verse one, he states, in the Lord I take refuge, and then, how can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to the mountain, to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. Now, whether this is an advisor or a friend who said to David, hey, look at the facts, look what's happening. We're gonna be overwhelmed with this darkness. And we're experiencing that already. And I think, I think it's going to get worse. So he's saying, why don't you just flee? Get out. Give up. And, and you notice it's a, it's a dangerous situation, right? He says that they bend the bow. That is, they're ready to shoot. They fitted their arrow to shoot the upright and heart. To put in our analogy today, the gun is loaded and it's pointed against the righteous. I don't mean that to be literally killing, but you know, understand the analogy. And, and, and so this advisor says, hey, David, flee like a bird to your mountain. Get out. I uh, had my morning walk this morning. I no longer can jog because of my knee, but I uh, ride bike. And then I was out walking this morning, and I certainly take a little route. And I, I try to pray as I do that as well. But the route that I take is, uh, you know, a lot of the birds are out early in the morning. And uh, one corner, every time I walk that corner, there's like 10 or 15 crows. You know, the road killers, right? And, uh, you know, they're pretty boisterous and everything, but as soon as they get near them, I'm not doing anything. I'm just walking. They flee. <laughs> they take off, you know, like I'm going to kill them. <laughs> this advisor is saying, David, I know that you say the Lord's your refuge, but hey, listen, flee to your mouth. This is serious stuff. They got our target. They got a target on our backs. The unrighteous wants to take us down. Listen, if we live as believers and follow Christ wholeheartedly in this day and age increasingly we are going to experience a storm no question about it we live out the gospel live out the truth of God's word and exclusive claims of the gospel we are going to be considered outliers we're going to be considered odd Oh, no, more than that, we're going to be considered threats. As this culture continues to take its dark turn. So if the foundations are destroyed, verse 3, what can the righteous do? 
the Hebrew they're probably suggesting, what can the righteous accomplish? And I don't think this, this friend is asking this question like, hey, what can we do? It's sort of like a resignation. Hey, we're, we're toast, David. Look, they're bending the bow. They're ready to shoot the arrow. So it's more like, what are we to do? <laughs> to give up. Run for the hills. Or probably we wouldn't get up and flee to a mountain, although that might be advantageous or maybe... But what would the church do? What is the danger for the church today? The danger for us is to flee, to become a holy huddle, to sort of be silent and say, it's just too bad. We can't do anything. And David would have none of that. Now, we know that Jesus warned us, did he not? He warned the disciples, and it's true for probably, this is a little bit anecdotal, but certainly, 50 to 60 percent of the church in the world today are experiencing the dark cloud persecution difficulties it's probably even higher than that but jesus said these words remember them he said if the world hates you know that it hated me because before it hated you if you were of the world the world would love its own but because you are not of the world but i chose you out of the world the world hates you a servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me they will persecute you also now, we've sort of been in an oasis here in the United States. I'm old enough, I won't give my actual age, but you know, back in the 50s, certainly in the 60s, you really said, you know, we could certainly live our lives and live our morality without too much harassment or ridicule, right? I mean, there was some confrontation, but that's not true today. The courts, the politicians, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It's you can't live the way God's called us to live, and be vocal about the gospel without increasingly the gathering storm. In fact, it's interesting that Jesus experienced that a little bit himself on the way to the cross. In John, uh, in Luke chapter 13, 31, 32, the Pharisees came and said to him. Hey, Jesus, get away from here. Herod wants to kill you. You know what Jesus' response was? Remember it? He said, he said to them, go tell that fox, it's an interesting word to use about Herod, go tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons, I am prefer, perform cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will finish my course. In other words, I'm on mission. I'm not going to flee. I'm not going to step away from the path. I'm on mission. Jim Johnson, who is a commentator on this passage, uh, makes, makes a statement. I think it's well, we need to hear it. He says, those who follow Christ today hear the same counsel of despair. Flee, get in your holy huddle, back off. We are told to abandon the work God has given us because the situation seems hopeless. The foundations are destroyed, they say. You can't hold back the tide. Don't waste your time. Now, if you're not experiencing that yet, you will be, or I will be, because it is probably going to get worse. Even for the church to meet together and to stand up for the truth. So David's saying, you know, I'm not going to flee. I'm not taking off to the mountain. I mean, God's called me to be king. God's called me to as a mission. I'm going to stay here and do what he's called me to do. Because I take refuge in the Lord. But he makes a second declaration, for which we get the second principle. Look at verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in the heaven. So what's that for us? Well, in the Lord I take refuge. Well, who is this Lord? Why do I take refuge in him in the midst of this gathering storm where the unrighteous seem to be overwhelming the righteous? So David says, well, let me tell you about my Lord. 
He is enthroned above. He is king. He's on the throne. He's sovereign. He's in his holy temple. So even though the, the foundations, and I'm talking about the moral foundation, the biblical foundations of our culture are collapsing, what is our hope? He's on the throne. This Lord who we take refuge in is on the throne. And we know that in numerous passages in the Old Testament, the Lord is enthroned in the heavens. He's sovereign. In fact, the psalmist in Psalm 123 writes these words to the Lord. To you, I lift up my eyes, O you who is enthroned in the heavens. It's not the politicians who are enthroned. It's not the philosophers who are enthroned. It is what? It is God who is enthroned. And David said, that's the one I take refuge in. So that's why I'm not fleeing. Huh. Are you kidding me? I've got God's on the throne. In him I take refuge. Now, there's three things he says in subsequent verses to, that tell us about the nature of God on the throne and what it means for us as we face this dark gathering storm. Number one, he is a king over all. He's enthroned and he sees everything. Notice the text here. Verse five. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. His eyes see. I think what the psalmist is saying there, David's saying, he's a throne, but he's not, he's not oblivious to what's happening. He's not like he's dispassionate. He sees everything that's happening. He's seeing the very foundations being destroyed. He sees everything. It's interesting, that second phrase is, eyelids test the children of men. Uh, a lot of commentators have said, what does he mean by that? We're not exactly sure, but uh, if, if I get a little sleepy and get a little, uh, what's the word, a little distracted, sometimes my eyelids will droop. Maybe you haven't experienced that. Especially my power nap at about noon or something. And I think what he's saying here, just saying another way, hey, his eyes are wide open. They're focused. He is seeing all that's happening. And David's saying, he sees what's happening around me and that the righteous are being targets. He sees. And he knows. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. So we're not a dispassionate king who's on the throne, just sort of, um, I'm too busy. He sees everything, what's happening on planet Earth and what's happening in your life and my life and what's happening in our culture. Second thing about this king is over, who's on the throne, he approves the righteous. Verse 5, the Lord tests the righteous. Hebrew scholars say you know, it's probably what he means there. He examines and approves the righteous. In other words, he sees the righteous, sees the righteous living the way they are, following God, following Christ, and he approves them. I was thinking of 1 Peter. I mean, going through the book of 1 Peter, my personal devotions are reminded again that in the early chapter of, of 1 Peter, where the as we know, those in 1 Peter are experiencing immense persecution. And Peter says, don't, hey, rejoice in these trials because he's testing the genuineness of your faith. That it will come out as gold. And, and, and you know, that's what trials do, right? And particularly for the suffering of the saints back then with Nero as the emperor. And what David is saying, I've got a king of the throne who not only sees, but he also sees my life. He tests my life and he approves. He approves. This king of the throne also has a third element. Verse 5, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who does violence. The Lord hates. What does he mean by that? He hates in the sense that he despises their wicked character and deeds 
and the rebellion against him. He actively opposes them and will judge them for their wickedness. So we got this God who's enthroned, David's saying, who I take refuge in, who sees, who approves the righteous. He knows what we're doing and, and being righteous and being lights in our world. And third, he also will judge the wicked. The psalmist wrote, wrote earlier in Psalm 5, verses 4 to 6, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhorbs the bloodthirsty man. This king who's on the throne sees everything. He blesses the righteous. He approves the righteous as we live righteously for him, for his name's sake. But he also is the judge and he takes notice of the wicked. And then David breaks forth in this uh, kind of uh, sentence prayer real quickly. He says, let him who reigns let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and scorching wind of their cup, and a scorching wind of their cup. <laughs> wow. Now, be careful here, because David's not saying, I'm going to get revenge. He's saying, I know who my God is. He's holy. He, and when his names, for his name's sake, God, if you didn't bring judgment, bring it. Bring it. That image of uh, fire and sulfur. What does that image remind you of, of a judgment in the Old Testament? It's Sodom and Gomorrah. It's interesting. Sodom and Gomorrah, as you look through the scripture, keeps coming up. New Testament, Old Testament, as sort of the benchmark of, of in addition to the flood itself, as God's righteous judgment. So what is the psalmist saying here so far? He says, number one, this gathering storm that we're experiencing that's going to probably be increasingly darker and hostile toward us, it says, number one, take refuge in the Lord. And this Lord, don't lose sight that he is on the throne, that he sees everything, and that he approves the righteous. He notices the righteous living in an unrighteous world, but he also ultimately will judge the wicked. Then verse 7. For the Lord loves the righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Third principle. We need to stay on mission. Do what God's called us to do as children of the light. And one day we, we will be rewarded with his everlasting presence in a place completely devoid of any more sin and sorrow and suffering. It says, for the Lord loves the righteous. You know, the danger, I think, for some of us, perhaps, and we all face this temptation, temptation is what? We want to be accepted. We want to be loved by other people. And maybe for the unbeliever, it says, hey, why don't you do what we do? And, and, and with the sense of acceptance, but... David's saying, listen, the Lord loves the righteous. I don't need to seek my acceptance from anybody else. I'm loved by him forever. But you notice the phrase there, he also loves righteous deeds. In other words, I think what David's saying here is that God doesn't want us in the midst of this dark storm and where, where the culture's going this way, opposite what the Bible teaches, opposite the gospel, where there may be persecution, certainly intolerance and ridicule and hostility. He doesn't want us to be passive and sort of say, well, I guess it's going to happen. We'll just wait. No. He says, do righteous deeds. Live out your mission. Walk as children of light in the midst of darkness. He loves righteous deeds. And the world needs to see that, don't they? Anyway, the good works. In fact, the, the, the foundation of good work is what? Sharing the gospel. <laughs> but we, we show Christ. He loves righteous deeds. Jim Johnson, again, in the commentary, I think he says it well. 
As the world shakes around us, we need to be sure that we continue to act justly before the Lord because the Lord loves righteous deeds. If we flee, we lose our Christian influence in the world. The opposite danger is to become so much like the world that we lose our distinct identity as Christians. We must remain people who reflect God's character in our hearts and in our actions. The Lord is righteous and he loves righteous deeds. His reward is for those who faithfully do what is right. This is an opportunity, brothers and sisters, at the church, Cornerstone Journey, to really begin to live and be distinct for the glory of Christ. There's not going to be any gray area anymore, probably. And then the reward, to see God's face. That's what I hope for, righteous, right? We do love righteous deeds and we're going to see God's face. We're going to be with him forever. In fact, Jesus said in John 14, 3, I will come again and take you to myself and there that where I am, you may also be. So let's go back to the question. If the foundations are destroyed, if, if the law and all morals collapse around our culture and we become, we already are the minority, we become the minority, there's hostility and there's ridicule and there's danger. What can we do? How do we live? We take refuge in the Lord, who is king over all, who will bring justice to the unrighteous and reward the righteous who do righteous deeds, rewarded with his glorious presence forever. Let me just close with two quotes from uh, Muller again that I think really hammer this home. He writes, by now, just about every thinking person acknowledges that massive and powerful forces are reshaping our world and fundamentally altering our culture. But Christians never panic. We face the truth and we see the reality. We are concerned, we are aware, diligent, discerning, caring, and sometimes even heartbroken. We see the gathering storm for what it is and dare not deny it. He goes on to write, Christians must not only confront this storm with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we must do so with full faith. Our hope does not rest with temporary political victory, though it, under, though it understands the importance of politics. It rests in the one who sits at the right hand of God, on the throne of God. It rests with the one through whom all things were created. Our faith is in the one who was nailed to the cross, rose from the grave, ascended into heaven, established the unchallenged rule over the cosmos. Death is defeated, the head of the serpent crushed. The attempt of secularism to usurp the rule of the Son of God amounts to the height of human folly. Nothing will prevail over our God. Nothing can withstand the power of his gospel through righteous deeds. The choice is this. Do we flee or do we have faith in God and our calling as the church to be the people God wants us to be? Because there's going to be a lot of needy people out there saying this isn't going to work. And we have the answer in Jesus Christ, don't we? Father, help us. And I certainly talk to myself here as well. Help us to, to not ignore the gathering storm, but not to panic, not to flee but to have faith as our protector, to have faith in you as the king over all, who sees all, who loves us as righteous people, who loves our righteous deeds, and who will reward us one day with your glorious presence in the new creation forever. Help us not to, to be condemnatory and judgmental, in the sense of uh, we would never do that because on by your grace that where we are today as the church of Jesus Christ, help us to be compassionate, but also proclaim the truth and to live out the truth in our marriages and in our homes to show what the counterculture really looks like when we follow Jesus Christ. And so we trust you. 
that even though the foundations seem to be crumbling around us, our trust is in you. And you are our foundation, ultimately. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless.